Well, good morning, good morning. Anybody grew up watching the monkeys on TV? When I was younger, believe it or not, my brother, who was older than me, was bigger than me and stronger than me. And uh, so whenever my parents were gone, he was in charge of the TV. And so that meant every day I was forced to either watch the monkeys or watch Beverly Hillbillies. And neither one of them are really my style. I was more like G.I. Joes and Care Bears. But uh, yes, okay, Care Bears was cool, okay? I'm just saying, even for a young boy. Okay. I told Paul after preaching in November, December for him, I said, hey, next time I preach, I need a hot tub ready for me so I can just jump in immediately after service. And so you can tell today we're ready for that. But, you know, Pastor Paul is in, in union today. Pastor Amy's on uh, vacation this week. And so he is in union. Uh, he has not been over there in a while, so he's over there preaching. And so as we are doing this series called Joseph, the Adrian Believer, uh, Pastor Paul has been asking the question at the beginning of every service, why Joseph? Why is there such a long stretch about Joseph in the Bible? And today, uh, the series has been focused on Joseph, but today we're going a different route. And we're, today we're going to be looking at Joseph's brothers. Uh, in particular, the name of today's message is the sins of your siblings, or the sins of the siblings. And uh, so the last time we saw his brothers, they were not looking too well in the story of Joseph. Uh, about 20 years before where we're at today, they had made a decision when Joseph came to visit them. They made a decision. They said, hey, we don't like him. How many of you have a younger sibling? And sometimes it can be a little annoying, right? That happens from time to time. Well, they decided they don't like him enough to the point that they decided, like, we're going to throw him into a pit because it's fun to throw your siblings into a hole. And so they threw him into a pit, and they were debating on whether or not to kill him or to just come out and, like, sell him. And so as they were debating, some people came along and said, hey, instead of killing him, let's get some money for some Mountain Dews on the way home. And they sold him into slavery. They took that money, and on the way home, they realized, like, uh-oh, like, we just sold our brother into slavery. Like, what are we going to tell mom and dad? So they took his coat, they put goat's blood on it, and they told their mom and, or they told their dad that he had died from a wild animal, and it caused lots of grief for their dad. So that's the last time we saw the, the siblings of Joseph in this story. Uh, they don't have a good light, right? Like they, they sold their brother into slavery, they lied to their dad about it. Uh, but sometimes the sins of siblings can have an impact on you, right? How many of you have an older sibling somewhere in your life, right? Uh, ha have any of you ever experienced the joy of, like, going to middle school or going to a high school or joining a new team, and then, but your brother was on that team or your sister was on that team a couple of years before or part of that classroom? And then you, the first day, the teacher's doing roll call, and it's like, hey, uh, Dylan Glastetter, present. Is your brother so-and-so? Yeah. You're not going to like me. Oh, no. Because sometimes we have to deal with that, like, understanding that our brother or sister went before us, and sometimes we have to deal with the sins of our sibling. I know I didn't really follow my brother in school because I went to a, a Christian school and he was in public school, uh, but I know my brother, and I know we're on live feed, so I'm going to kind of speak carefully. My brother has had a past of issues. He's currently um, living on the state. He's in jail right now getting rehab, and so I'm praying for him, but He's had a rough go of life, and uh, a couple of years ago, I was talking to my buddy Jason Gibson. He used to be a uh, police officer here in town, and I was talking with some of his 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 uh, officer buddies, and they I said, yeah, you probably know my, my brother. Like, what's your name? I said, my name's Dylan Glastitter. And they said, what's your brother's name? And I, I said my brother's name, and they all, like, went to their holsters. I'm like, hey, 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 I'm not, I'm not like my brother. Like, I'm a pastor here in town. Like, I swear I'm not into the same things he was. And uh, they're like, all right, and they slowly put their weapons down, but then they got their tasers out just in case, but... So sometimes you have to deal with, like, the notoriety of your, your siblings going before you. I know my own two kids, um, my son's a little older, my daughter's a little younger. That's how it works when one's older, the other one's younger. Um, but when they went to school, they had the same guidance counselor. And my, my kids are both wonderful kids, but they're just different when it comes to school. My son was a lot like me, where he could do absolutely nothing and get A's and B's, and he was fine with that the same way I was fine with that. My daughter, like like tries at school and gets her like really good grades and she's like if she doesn't get a, a hundred or plus she like gets a fit like oh no I only have an A plus not an A plus plus like so whenever the guidance counselor got Amber they're like you're Garrett's sister like yeah like well Garrett tried to take all the easy classes on purpose she's like yeah you're taking all hard classes yeah you guys are different yeah <laughs> very different but sometimes our our, our siblings kind of their sins kind of speak into our lives and sometimes affects our lives. So we're, we're taking a look at the brothers today. And this is about 20 years after the fact of them selling their brother Joseph into slavery. 
And so as they come before, uh, as they come back in the store, we don't know full, the full detail. We don't know where their hearts are at. We don't know if they've changed their ways. We don't know if they still have hatred in their hearts for Joseph, even though it's been 20 years later. We don't know if they've killed Benjamin, which was Joseph's other brother, which is Jacob's other favorite son, because uh, his two sons with Rachel was, was Joseph and Benjamin. So we don't know if, he killed, if they killed the other son, but we can learn a lot from their sins today. And I understand that sin is not really a fun topic. Hey, welcome to church. We're talking about sin today. The very thing that will cause your demise. Like, welcome. We're glad you're here today. Um, <clears throat> but very briefly, sin is any action that steps out of God's loving and just nature. Like, God has a plan for each one of us. And sin is an action that takes us out of that plan. It takes us out of his nature of being loving and just to the people around us. And in fact, sin separates humanity from God. And so, as Kent was talking earlier about the veil between the the Holy of Holies and the rest of the, the the temple, it was that veil that separated the sin of the people from God. And only priests could go in and, and had to make atonement for and sacrifices for us as followers. And so that's kind of what it's talking about because sin is something that separates humanity from God. Now, I think, unfortunately, in 2024 America, a lot of us have probably grown up being a little too comfortable with sin in our lives. Like, I remember being in high school and things that were totally inappropriate now are just, like, commonplace today. Like, look, when I was in high school, like, if somebody had had relations before they were married, that was like, oh, my goodness. Like, they did what? And when people were living together before marriage, it was like, oh, my gosh, really? And then now it's like, that's just no big deal. Like, I remember when I married Laura, like, there were people at my job that was like, how's, I don't want to get into that. But, it was, like, they were surprised. <laughs> They were surprised that I had not had relations before. Like, what if she's a dud? Like, that's, your mindset is totally not where my mindset is, right? And so things that were normal back then, or were not normal back then, have become more normal now. And I think sometimes we fall into a situation where we understand and we, we know we're not going to commit the big sins, right? The quote-unquote big sins. Like, I'm never, as much as my brother causes me grief, I'm probably never going to sell him into slavery. And... It might be fun to throw him in a hole, but it, I'm never going to, like, throw him in a pit and de determine how I can get rid of him. Like, that's not something that's going to happen. But, and so a lot of us would say, yeah, I'm not going to get involved with big sins in my life. But the problem is we often let a bunch of little sins into our lives. A bunch of little things. We're like, well, that's not a big deal. It's just, it's just how I talk at work. I don't talk that way at church or I don't talk that way, you know, around my family. Or, you know, when nobody's home, it's okay if I watch that because... It doesn't really hurt anything. It doesn't hurt anybody. And we have to be careful of the things we're allowing in. Here's the problem with that, though. We say, hey, I'm not going to do the big sins, but I'm okay with some small sins. The problem is God sees sin as sin. In God's eyes, it's not big sin and little sin. The fact is that there's sin, and that sin separates us from him. So today we're going to look at Genesis 42 through uh, the first part of uh, chapter 43. And this is a little bit of reading. And so I just want you guys to, to, to be here with me. Pay attention, understand what's being said, but also understand, like, the, the feeling of what's going on. I know Pastor Paul, a lot of times, will have everybody stand whenever we read the word. Uh, we're not going to do that this morning because, like, your knees are going to be hurting. Okay, so um, so we are in Genesis 42, and we're going to be learning about the brothers this morning. So, here we go. When Jacob heard that, that grain was available in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why are you standing around looking at one another? I've heard there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy enough grain to keep us alive. Otherwise, we'll die. I just want to say, first of all, that is such a dad thing going on right there in those verses, right? But dad finds out there's a food somewhere, and he just looks at his sons, and he's like, why are you guys just standing around looking at each other? Go do some work. Go get the food. Make a trip. You know, I, my, my dad is sitting right there, so I can't say anything. First service, I would tell the truth. <coughs> well, my dad would have this, like, Dylan, why are you mowing the grass? Because I'm 16 and I want to mow the grass, go mow the grass. <laughs> okay. You know, or anytime I want to go to my friend's house, it was like, yeah, you can go to your friend's house, son. Yay, thanks, Dad. You have to clean the garage first. My initial response is, it's your garage, not my garage. I don't know why. I'd... And the second response is, I don't care about hanging out with my friend today after all. I'll just go back inside. It's not a big deal. <coughs> Continuing on. So Joseph's 10 older brothers went down to Egypt to buy grain. But Jacob wouldn't let Joseph's younger brother, ben Benjamin, go with him for fear some harm might come to him. 
So Jacob's sons arrived in Egypt along with others to buy food, for the famine was in Canaan as well. Since Joseph was a governor of all Egypt and in charge of selling grain to all the people, it was to him that his brothers came. When they arrived, they bowed before him and their faces, with their faces to the ground. Joseph recognized his brothers instantly, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where are you from, he demanded. From the land of Canaan, they replied. We have come to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they didn't, rec- they didn't recognize him. And he remembered the dreams he had had about them many years before. He said to them, you are spies. You have come to see how vulnerable our land has become. No, my lord, they exclaimed. Your servants have simply come to buy food. We are all brothers, members of the same family. We are honest men, sir. We are not spies. Yes, you are, Joseph insisted. You have come to see how vulnerable our land has become. Sir, they said, they, there actually were 12 of us. We, your servants, are all brothers, sons of a man living in the land of Canaan. Our youngest brother is back there with our father right now, and one of our brothers is no longer with us. But Joseph insisted, as I said, you are spies. This is, why, this is how I will test your story. I swear by the life of fair that you will never leave Egypt unless your younger brother comes here. One of you must go and get your brother. I'll keep the rest of you here in prison. Then you'll find out whether or not your story is true. But the life of, by the life of Pharaoh, if it turns out that you don't have a younger brother, then I'll know you are spies. So Joseph put them all in prison for three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, I am a God-fearing man. If you do as I say, you will live. If you really are honest men, choose one of your brothers to remain in prison. The rest of you may go with, with grain for your starving families. But you must bring your youngest brother back to me. This will prove that you are telling the truth and you will not die. To this they agreed. Speaking among themselves, they said, Clearly we are being punished because of what we did to Joseph long ago. We saw his anguish when he pleaded for his life, but we wouldn't listen. That's why, that's why we're in this trouble. Didn't I tell you not to, not to sin against that boy, Reuben asked? But you wouldn't listen, and now we have to answer for his blood. Of course, they didn't know that Joseph understood them, for he had been speaking to them through an interpreter. Now he turned away from them, and he began to weep. When he regained his composure, he spoke to them again. Then he chose Simeon from among them and had him tied up right before their eyes. Joseph then ordered his servants to fill the men's sacks with grain, but he also gave secret instructions to return each brother's payment at top of his sacks. At top of his sack. He also gave them supplies for their journey home, so the brothers loaded their donkeys with the grain and headed for home. But when they stopped for the night, one of them opened his sack to get grain for his donkey and found his money in the top of the sack. Look, he exclaimed to his brothers, my money has been returned. It's here in my sack. Then their hearts sank. Trembling, they said to each other, what has God done to us? When the brothers came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan, they told them everything that had happened to them. The man who is governor of the land spoke with harsh, spoke very harshly to us, they told him. He accused us of being spies scouting the land. But we said, we are honest men, not spies. We are 12 brothers, sons of one father. One brother is no longer with us, and the youngest brother is at home with our father in the land of Canaan. Then the man who was governor of the land told us, this is how I will find out if you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me and take grain for your starving families and go on home. But you must bring your youngest brother back to me. Then I will know you are honest men and not spies. Then I will give you back your brothers, and you may trade freely in this land. As they emptied out their sacks, their There in each man's sack was a bag of money that had been paid for the grain. The brothers and their father were terrified when they saw the bags of money. Jacob explained, You you are robbing me of my children. Joseph is gone. Simeon is gone. And now you want to take Benjamin too. Everything is going against me. Then Reuben said to his father, You may kill my two sons if I don't bring Benjamin back to you. I'll be responsible for him, and I promise to bring him back. But Jacob replied, My son will not go down with you. His brother Joseph is dead, and he is all I have left. If anything should happen to him on this journey, you would send this grieving, white-haired man to his grave. Chapter 43. But the famine continued to ravish the land of Canaan. When the grain they had brought from Egypt was almost gone, Jacob said to his sons, Go back and buy us a little more food. But But Judah said, The man was serious when he warned us, You won't see my face again unless your brother is with you. If you send Benjamin with us, we will go down and buy more food. But if you don't let Benjamin go... We won't go either. Remember the man said, you won't see my face again unless your brother is with you. Why were you so cruel to me, Jacob moaned. Why did you tell him you had another brother? The man kept asking us questions about our family. They replied, he asked, is your father still alive? Do you have another brother? 
So we answered his questions. How could we know he would say, bring your brother down here? Judah said to his, to his father, send the boy with me and he will be on our way. Otherwise, we will all die of starvation and not only, and not only we, but you and your little ones as well. I personally guarantee his safety. You may hold my, me responsible if I don't bring him back to you. Then let me bear the blame. Then let me bear the blame forever. If we had, hadn't wasted all this time, we could have gone and returned twice by now. So their father Jacob finally said to them, "If I can't be, if it can't be avoided, then at least do this: pack your bags with the best products of this land, take them down to the man as gifts: balm, honey, gum, aromics, resin, pistachio nuts, and almonds. Also, take double the money that was put back in your sacks, as it was probably someone's mistake. Then take your brother and go back to the man." May God Almighty give you mercy as you go before the man so that he will release Simeon and let Benjamin return. But if I must lose my children, so be it. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today, Lord. We ask you just to bless us for the next few moments as we read, as we study the word of God. Father, I pray that we can have a better understanding of sin in our lives and how it not only affects us, but our relationship with you and affects those around us. Father, we ask you to bless us in the next few moments. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so that is a long passage, right? But there's a lot of stuff going on in that passage. And so today as we talk about the sins of the siblings, we're going to talk about the effects that sins has on them but also also on us. And the first thing is that sin mars your reputation. See, Joseph has not seen his brothers for like 20 years and hasn't seen Benjamin for even longer. And so as the brothers show up before him, Joseph immediately understands and realizes that this is his brother standing before him. But because of the sin in their lives, it's marred their reputation. And so when Joseph sees him, his head is full of different things. Because for the last 20 years, he's been wondering about his dad. He's been wondering about his brothers. He's been wondering about whether or not his, his brother Benjamin is still alive. And so as his brothers stand before him, he knows the reputation that they have for being people that um, have a history of, of sinfulness. They have a history of making bad decisions when it comes to uh, their family life. So he's questioning himself as he sees me. He says, man, is my dad alive or dead? Because Joseph doesn't know if Jacob is still alive or if he's dead at this point. And the, he's questioning, if he is dead, then how are my brothers treating Benjamin, my full brother? How are they treating Benjamin? And then, or do they hate Benjamin like me? Or have they already killed Benjamin? Have they already sold him into slavery? Does dad know the truth that I'm still alive? There's a lot of things that Joseph is thinking about as he is sitting here looking at his brothers. But in the conversation that they have, he realizes that there's another brother left at home. And so Joseph begins to have hope because Joseph also knows that the, the vision, the dream that God gave him when he was younger was the fact that his 11 brothers would bow down before him. And here he is standing there, the, the leader of the land, right? And 10 of his brothers are standing before him bowing before him, coming to him for food. And so right there he knows, like, you know what? The dream that God gave me was that 11 of my brothers were here. And so Joseph began to have hope that his 11th brother, Benjamin, was still alive. And then it's confirmed whenever he's talking to his brothers that, you know what? There is another brother back home. And so he begins to understand that. And so what happens is he doesn't trust his brothers because the sin mars the reputation because whenever we have sin in our lives, whenever stuff like that comes out, it affects our, it affects our situation. You had an older brother or sister in school, and they acted a fool. The teacher remembers that when it comes time to you, right? Because they remember the reputation of your, your honorary brother or sister. And so where Joseph is at now is he understands the sins of his siblings. He understands that their reputation is marred in front of him. And so now he starts going from... How do I get back to my brothers? Do I forgive them? Like, instead of all of that, Joseph has now switched his brain, and now he is, his utmost importance is trying to get Benjamin to himself in a safe way. He wants to make sure that his other brother is safe, that he's not in harm's way, that his siblings aren't doing anything to him or being mean to him. And so Joseph, who is going to eventually forgive his brothers, and, we'll, and Pastor Paul is going to talk more about that next week, Right now, his utmost importance is about making sure that his brother Benjamin is safe. If you're part of the men's reading plan here at Lightstream Church, like a week or two ago, we, we covered this in the reading plan, and there were some questions that people were asking. And the questions were along the line of, like, why is Joseph being so mean to his brother? Why is Joseph, like, acting like a jerk? And it wasn't that. The fact is that Joseph 
was trying to make sure, he was trying to devise a plan and make sure that his other brother, Benjamin, would be made safe and be able to be brought to him so he could be reunited with his brother. And so all of the imprisonment, all of the keeping the brother back, all of the threats, all of that was to try to secure safe passage for his brother Benjamin to come back to him. And so because of their history, because of the sins of their past, their brother's reputation is marred uh, because of the sins they have in their life. Here's the other thing we note is that whenever Jacob sent the, the sons to, to get food, he did not send Benjamin. And I don't know if Jacob knows what the boys did. I don't know if he ever realizes that truth. But I do think that Jacob had a suspicion or he had an understanding that the last time he sent a brother, one of his sons, sorry, one of his sons with the other ten sons, things didn't go right. And Joseph didn't come back. And we see that play out as as Jacob says to the brothers, hey, you all go get food, but Benjamin's staying back because I don't want him to, to come across harm's way the way that Joseph did the last time he went and saw you, went with you guys. So the sin uh, in their life marred their reputation. The next thing that sin does is it weighs on your conscience. We see through, see through this passage different things, different ways, that some of the brothers are having a heavy conscience because of things that have happened in their lives. We see Reuben is dealing with a heavy conscience because of his part that he played in the role with Joseph and um, uh, being part of the brothers that threw him in a pit, sold him into slavery, contemplated death. But he also is dealing with a heavy conscience because of what happened with him and Bilhah. Now, in Genesis 35, we know that Reuben had um, relations with uh, his dad's concubine, Bilhah. Now, that's a little weird, right? Imagine your half-brother has relations with your mom. That's weird, right? Like in, day, in today's day and age, that's, that's very weird. Well, back then, I'm going to tell you, it's very weird as well. And because of what Reuben did, because he had these relations, he was cut off as receiving the inheritance that, that Jacob had for him, right? So Jacob, being the firstborn, Reuben was going to get the inheritance, all the land, all the money, like the, the nice Xbox, the nice car. He's going to get all the good stuff whenever that time came. But because he had relations with his stepmom, I guess it would be sort of his stepmom, because of that, he is cut off now from that inheritance, and it goes on to the next person, right? And so Reuben is dealing not only with the guilty conscience because of Joseph, but also what happened with Bilhah. Like, Reuben's got some stuff going on. He's got a history, okay? And so we look at the next set of brothers. The next two that were in line to, to receive the inheritance was Simeon and Levi, and they have a guilty conscience because of what happened with Joseph, but they also have a guilty conscience because of what happened with their sister Dinah. Now, their sister Dinah, we see earlier on in Genesis, uh, Dinah was taken, and she was raped by a man in a city. And the man in the city decided that he loved her, and so he goes to Dinah's brothers and says, hey, I sort of kind of raped your sister, but I want to marry her and make her an honest woman now. Is that okay with you? And, you know, as a couple brothers dealing with that with a sister, like, it didn't go over really well, right? So they... They came up with a plan and said, well, no, yeah, you can marry our sister, but here's the thing. Like, we can't, have our, we can't have our sister marry anybody that's uncircumcised. So we need you and we need all the men of your village to get circumcised. And so they're like, yeah, like, yeah, I, I love her and I want her to be my wife. And so they go through the process of circumcising all the men in that city. Now, I know that when babies get circumcised, they kind of bounce back pretty quick, right? It's not a big deal to them. I would only assume as a grown man that it might be a little bit longer process as far as, like, the healing process. And uh, not to mention, like, babies now, they have, like, scapulas. Back then, they had, like, a sharp rock. You know, like, there, there are some issues with getting circumcised back then like this. And the youth pastor part of me wants to say some more, but I'm just going to – pastor's wife's here now, so i got to clean it up. So um, just a little off the top. Okay. Uh, so here's the thing is the brother, the, they, the whole city agrees to this. All the guys get circumcised. And so for a few days, all the men are gingerly walking around town, just kind of enjoying life with a slow pace, you know. And um, this is always like my favorite story as a teenager in the Bible, one of them. Because I just, so I imagine all these men kind of just walking slowly through town. And then here comes Simeon and Levi. And I just, like in my head, I see like the smoke rolling behind them. 
and they're walking in. Like, and I, I don't know why, I assume like a gladiator uniform, like some kind of war garb, and they got swords, and they're just kind of twirling them around. And they go through town, the smoke is billowing, and dogs are running out of the way. They're like, oh, the fearless warriors, you know. And what happens is, uh, Simeon and Levi, they go through town, and they use their swords on every single man in the town. They put every single one of them to death. And they can't really, like, get away because they're a little tender still. And I just love that story because, one, the visual of, like, them just rolling through town and smoke and just everything. But they're just, like, that's a smart plan. Isn't it? Like, we're going to make you slow and then come after you. Like, it's like, what a perfect plan. But here's the thing. As a teenager, I love that story. But as an adult, I understand some issues with that story. Because even though what happened was wrong, murdering like 400 people is probably not a just response to that, right? And not only that, but we see that Simeon and Levi did not uh, take time to talk to their father, to get consult consultation, to get consent. They didn't think about anything. They just went and responded with violence and killed all the men of this town. Now, that could have started a war. That could have started all kinds of things going on with the people. And, you know, although it's my favorite story from as a teenager, uh, that could have been a big problem. And so what happens was their violent reactions and their inability to consult their dad and talk to their dad about all this disqualified them as well from receiving that firstborn heirs. So they are, have a guilty conscience of what happened with Joseph, but also because of what they did to all the men of this town. Even though they felt justified at the moment, it was not handled the right way. The next brother was Judah, and Judah disqualified himself by suggesting he was the one that suggested to sell Joseph in the first place. And then he suggested that, hey, why don't we lie to dad about it and just you know, tell him that a wild animal got it? So he lies, which brought deep grief to Jacob for years. And now at this point, Judah himself is a dad. And Judah himself has lost a child. So Judah now understands the pain and the heartbreak and the sorrow that comes along with lo losing a child. So not only is he guilty about what happened to Joseph, but now he also feels the guilt about what he's done to his dad and the guilt and the sorrow that he's caused his dad because he understands it as well. The, that sin weighs heavy on his conscience. Here's the bottom line. We could go on through the brothers, but here's the bottom line is that sin weighs heavy on your conscience. When you have sin in your life, it weighs heavy because we know that something's not right. We know that we're not right with God. We know often we're not right with people around us because of things we've done. And sin can weigh heavy on your conscience. I'm going to encourage you, if you are battling with something in your life, I'm going to encourage you to talk to someone. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's a, a friend, a coworker. Maybe it's one of the pastors here at church. You definitely need to talk to God about it. But you need to be able to talk to somebody and here's the thing, if sin is, doesn't weigh heavy on your heart, if sin doesn't weigh heavy on your conscience, then you might need to start praying for a miracle, a miracle of your soul for God to transform the callous heart. Because if you have sin in your life and it, you don't care about it, you're not affected by that sin, you're not affected by, from a guilty conscience, you're not affected from feeling remorse from it, can I say that you have a callous heart towards God? And the first step we need to do is ask God to, man, Father, help me to feel this. Help me to, to feel the need to get rid of us. We can't allow sin to just take place in our life. We can't let it take root in our hearts. And when we do that, we no longer feel affected by it, then we find ourselves in a very tough situation with our Heavenly Father. Our first motivation needs to be to please God. The reason we have remorse, the reason we have a guilty conscience, and we want to get rid of that is because we want to, we want to please God. We want to be right in relationship with God. The second motive we have, and this is more of a selfish motive, but it's okay, is that we want to remove the weight and the pain and the hurt that sin has on our lives. As we look at, as we look at the brothers, we see them dealing with some heavy conscious situations, some heavy pain, some heavy hurt from things they've done. And we see that start to play out. It's like, man, why didn't we leave him alone? Why did we do this? Didn't I tell you? And when they find the money, they're saying, God, this is God getting back at us because of what we did for our brother. They're starting to feel remorse. They're starting to understand that what they did was so wrong. They might not have realized the pain they were going to cause, but they have caused huge amounts of pain, and they're starting to process that. Here's the other thing that sin does, we learn from the brothers, that sin brings grief to those around you. <clears throat> when the brothers arrive at home, they tell their dad all the news, and the dad is all distraught again, because not only did he lose Joseph already, but now Simeon is being held back, 
And he knows that in order to get new food, he now has to send Benjamin down. And so not only has he been had distraught for the last couple decades over losing Joseph, now he's got Simeon in prison, and he doesn't want to use, lose Benjamin either. These brothers had no idea about the grief their father was going to go through as they did what they did to Joseph. They did not realize the impact that it was going to have on them that would play out not for a year, not for a decade, but for multiple decades and 20-plus years. Their father is dealing with the pain and the sorrow and the hurt of everything that's going on. They did not count the cost when selling Joseph and lying to their father. Sin not only weighs on your conscience, but it also brings a lifetime of grief, sorrow, trauma, and anxiety to those around you. A lot of times we think, oh man, this is just my sin. It's going to impact me. It's going to affect me. It doesn't have any impact on anybody else. Well, that's a lie. Because when we are living wrong, it does impact us. It impacts our relationship with him, but it also impacts our families. It impacts the people around us. When we sin, it is an issue for everybody that's connected with us because our sin is out of God's plan. If we're living outside of God's plan, then we're not doing what we need to do for those around us. The the next thing, sin, sin, sorrow brings repentance. Here's the good thing. When you have a heavy heart, when you have a guilty conscience, that sin, sorrow can bring repentance, and that's good news. Sorrow of sin can bring you to a place of repentance and ultimately forgiveness. Uh, 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 11 says, Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorrow, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance. That leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you, what earnestness and eagerness to clear yourselves. What indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. I love this passage because it really lays out the entire process of going from having sin in our lives to where God wants us to be. So we're going to look at a few key words here. First of all, the word sorry. The word sorry. Like we think, man, I'm sorry for what I've done. And sorry can be a good thing. But here's the thing. Sorrow can also be kind of an excuse. Because are you really sorry for what you did? Are you sorry that you got caught? Are you sorry that, that, that you know, man, my dad or mom or husband or wife or whatever, they found out about it, and now I'm sorry that I got busted for it, right? I remember being a teenager, being at home, I would be upstairs uh, watching TV or reading my Bible like a good student, always reading, just reading my Bible up there. And I would hear my dad from downstairs, Dylan! And my brain would instantly go into overdrive, like, oh. <laughs> I would hear my dad bellow from his lair below, and I was just like, oh, no. And so I'm going downstairs. I'm like, oh, man, what, what did I do? What, did I, what am I getting in trouble for? What did Dad find out about? And, you know, you start working the apology like, Dad, I'm really sorry for whatever it is that you caught me doing. I, I really apologize, you know. And, you know, but how do you know that's not really a place of, of being sorry, right? You're sorry you got caught. You, you know, you're, you're planning you're sorry for whatever I did wrong. I apologize. Husbands, do we do that sometimes with our wives? Babe, I'm so sorry. For what? I'm just sorry. <laughs> I do a lot of things wrong. I'm sorry. Just, just a blanket forgiveness is what I ask from you right now. But see, Paul says he's not, his happiness doesn't come from sorrow. He says, yet now I am happy not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. And that's the next key word. The next key word is repentance, which is godly sorrow brings repentance. And it's an act of turning around, ceasing sinful plans, and then making a new plan. So repent, like repentance is saying, hey, I'm doing this wrong. I'm sinning. It repents and saying, hey, no, I'm not sorry for it. I'm stopping it. I'm turning away from it. And now I'm heading towards the plan that God has for me in my life. Being over here, I'm just saying, oh, man, I'm sorry I got caught. And then you do it some more. It's not true repentance. Repentance is saying, hey, this is something I was doing. I'm stopping it. I'm turning around. I'm heading in the right direction. But here's the other thing that's interesting, that repentance in and of itself is not forgiveness. Right? Repentance is what we are doing in response to God. Repentance is what we are doing in response to the sin of our lives. What comes next when we are truly repentant before God is that God gives us forgiveness. He goes on that verse, he says, But because your sorrow led to your repentance, for you became sorrowful as God intended, and so we're not harmed in any way before us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation. That next word is that next key word is salvation, and that is referencing the forgiveness of that we have from the Father whenever we are truly repentant and turn away from the sinful ways that we've we've been living in our lives. So when we turn away from those, we have salvation. 
And salvation is forgiveness, but it's not just forgiveness. It's also the means to maintain righteous living as we follow Christ in our lives. So we have forgiveness, but also he gives us the ability to continue to live the right ways and live for God. And then one of the good parts too, the next part there, uh, repentance leads to salvation and it leaves no regret. No regret, right? When you repent, we trust Jesus for salvation. We receive forgiveness and righteousness of God for our future. The regret is li lifted off of our lives. Look, I want to go through life repentant of sins I've committed. I want to go through life understanding and accepting the forgiveness and the salvation that Jesus has for me. But I also want to go through life without the regret holding me back, without the regret, regret constantly being on my shoulders. If God has forgiven me, I need to also learn to forgive myself. And, it's, and what Paul's saying here is that God leads us to salvation and leaves no regret in our lives. Don't you want that for your life? Don't you want to move away from the feelings of like, man, I, I like, look, we have sin in our lives, and I always mess up, and I'm always this, and I'm always that. But you know what? God wants us to move beyond that part of our lives. He doesn't want us dwelling and just constantly bringing up old regrets and old things like that. He wants us to move on. Verse 11 says, see what this godly sorrow is producing you, what earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. So what are the results when we have repentance, we receive salvation, and we the, no reg the regret is lifted off our shoulders? What are the results of that? We are earnest in our faith and our love. We are earnest about doing things in faith and love for the people around us. We are eager to keep our conscience and our life clear. We are eager to say, well, you know what? I'm not going to dabble with that because I want to keep my life clear. I've been down that road. I've made that mistake. And at this point, I'm eager to stay away from that at this point, right? I don't want to be caught up with that anymore. You know, in this day and age, it, it, it's funny because a lot of times when you say no to things, there are a lot of things in the world that the Bible doesn't necessarily is like is sin of in and of itself. But we can be honest with ourselves and say, well, no, that's borderline. If I get into that, I might be getting into a tricky situation. Maybe that's something you listen to, the things you watch, the way you talk, different things. Like there are things that are kind of like borderline. But what if instead of saying, man, how, how much can I watch? How much can I listen to? How much can I say before it's actually sin? What if instead we had an eagerness to have a clear conscience and a clear life before the Lord? And we weren't worried about, like, man, I, I could do that. I could technically do that. But what do we say? Well, you know what? I'm not going to mess with that because I want to make sure that I'm clear before the Lord. Right? Also said that we have an indignation and alarm for sin. We look at those things and we're like, well, you know what? I'm not going to fall back into that trap. Whenever we're, we're, we're given the opportunity or the temptation to sin, there's an alarm that goes off inside of us. Like, well, you know what? If I continue down this path, I'm going to end up somewhere I don't want to go. And because of that, I'm going to allow this alarm that I have from the Lord to help me steer clear of heading down that wrong path again. That is what Paul is saying that we have. We have the uh, indignation and alarm for sin. We also have a longing for good and holy living. How many of you want to do good and holy things in this life? I want to be a person that when people come in contact with me, they're like, man, Dylan brightened my day to day. Dylan did something like Dylan spoke life into me today. Dylan encouraged me today. I want to do things that are good and holy and help people around me, not bring people down. And so we see this starting to play out in the, the, the brothers' lives. We see them starting to kind of get into a place of repentance. And next week, Pastor Paul is going to talk more about forgiveness and reconciliation. He's going to be talking about that. And so we're going to see a lot of that next week. But we, we see that start to happen now. And so they were not ending on this note of like, sin, 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 sin. Here's the last thing we learned. We learned that sin is swallowed in forgiveness. No matter what that sin is, big or small, like we talked about earlier, it's swallowed up in the forgiveness that the Lord has for us when we truly are repentant and we turn to him. Next week, we're going to carefully look at the reconcilia reconciliation and forgiveness that occurs in Joseph's family uh, because it's a beautiful story, and Pastor Paul is going to share about that next week. But as we close here, I want to share a verse. 1 John 1, 8 through 9, it says, If we claim to be without sin... We receive ourselves, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. As the worship team comes up, we think back to Joseph's brothers, and we understand that they made a lot of mistakes. We also read here in First John, which they didn't have back then, but we have it today, 
that when we confess our sins, we lay before the Lord, he is faithful and just to forgive us, right? He wants to purify, purify us and make us righteous again. And so the same way that, the, that, that Joseph's brothers are starting to reconcile with the wrongs they've had, and they're starting to have repentant hearts, like they plotted murder, they sold their brother, they lied to the father for 20 years. We see that the sorrow and repentance is starting to happen in their lives. It's starting to take root of them, and they're starting to change their heart. They're, trying, they're starting to change their song that they're singing, starting to change their reputation, right? They're getting to that point, and we know that their salvation is coming. Well, today, I want us to understand that your salvation is here for you now, if you're ready for it. You know, look, let's be real. We all sin in our lives. We all have things that we do that aren't right. If we can have an attitude of like, well, nobody can tell me what's right or wrong. Well, the Word of God does. And if you're following Him, this is the standard that we live by. We're supposed to be obedient to Him. We're supposed to follow His ways. We're supposed to be like His Son. Look, I don't think that any one of us are going to ever be perfect, but it doesn't mean that we can't strive for perfection. It doesn't mean that we can't strive to be exactly like Jesus wants us to be. See, every single one of us serve a forgiving God. And there's forgiveness for each one of us as we follow after him. So this morning as we respond, I want to respond this way. First of all, can everybody stand up? I think when we stand up, we're, we're ready to move, we're ready to groove, we're ready to do whatever it is that we're being asked to do. So as we respond this morning, I have two questions for you. First of all, if you're in the room today, you say, Pastor Dylan, I understand that I have sin in my life. And maybe you've never given your life to God. You've never heard that he wants to forgive you of your sins. You've never understood that, you know, part of salvation is being repentant of those sins and coming to the Father and allowing him to do a work in you. If that's you today and you, and you say, well, no, Pastor Dylan, I want to give my life to Christ. I want God to be the Lord.